What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Happy Monday. Welcome to Daily Gaming News. We are your hosts. I am Roan. I am Kaisa, and we are so excited. We have a ton of news for you this Monday. How's everyone doing? How are you doing, Roan? I'm doing really good. Kika just got back into town on nice. Friday, so she's catching up on some sleep and not getting jet lagged as we are also uh, producing our film and just been looking at what's going on in the gaming industry, looking at new games coming up, excited about that Star Wars Squadrons, which drops this week. So yeah, there's a lot been going on. What about you? Totally. I'm good. I just started playing The Witcher and The Witcher 3. And nice. I'm like, I know people are excited to talk about it, but I'm also like, I'm trying to play through this without having any hints. So trying to, you know, not, you know, dampen everyone's day by being like, oh, you yeah. can't be excited about this game and talk about it in my chat but also wanting to like experience it for my own is what I'm currently working with. 100% that it's it, with those story driven games. It's hard to avoid that um, kind of okay. feedback as you're going through the journey. Mm -hmm. What's up everybody. Espresso, Guff, Kane. How are we doing today? I hope everyone's had an amazing weekend and is excited about another new week. So some news we're going to get into today. We're going to start out with Amazon announcing their new cloud gaming service called Luna because if there's anything we need, it's another cloud gaming service. Exactly. We're also going to be talking about the Xbox Series X releases, the information regarding its one terabyte expansion, and it's a pretty hefty cost. We're going to talk about how Spider-Man PS4 owners can't upgrade to the PS5 version for, uh, for free, Sony finally confirms. We're also going to be talking about Call of Duty Warzone Season 6, which launches tomorrow, and talk about some the unexpected new feature. We're going to get into Star Wars Squadrons, progression rewards, and more, which have been detailed. We're also going to talk about uh, Among Us 2 being canceled, but for a good reason. And we're going to get into our silly game of the week, which is the Flight Sim Airplane Mode, which launches in October. And it's not a flight sim like Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's a flight sim where you are sitting on the plane. Oh, yeah, it's exactly that. And then also, if we have enough time, we're going to dive into the Bethesda founder discussing the sale to Microsoft and what it could mean for their in-development games. And we've got a few topics that we do have time, including, you know, our eSports roundup. And we're going to talk about Facebook gaming and Farmville and also Xbox Series X pre-orders. But as always, throughout the whole show, we're playing a game called What's in the Mug? What's in the Mug for us today? Throw when your guesses in the chat and some of you might get it right right away. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see if it'll be like last <laughs> week where we forgot to tell people because no one could get it right. Right. Thank you so much, Kane, for giving us up to Expresso Shot. Thank you so much. And Thanks. with that, let's get into our first story as Amazon announces the new cloud gaming service called Luna. So I don't think it's any surprise at all that this is happening because at its 2020 hardware event, Amazon announced a cloud gaming platform called Luna. And this news isn't too surprising, as the service has been rumored since last year, previously codenamed Tempo, while an Amazon-made game controller leaked out just ahead of that event. It's still not clear when Luna will be launched widely, launched widely, but it will initially be available on PC, Mac, Fire TV, and iPhone, and iPad via web apps, with an Android version planned for after launch, which is an interesting move. Amazon says that interested users in the U.S. can request early access to the service. You know, you can already sign up for that now if you want to. There's no word yet on international availability. And the service will be available for an in inductory price of... Introductory price of a $5.99 a month during its early access phase, which gives subscribers the ability to play Luna Plus channel games across two devices simultaneously and offers 4K 60 frames per second resolution for select titles. Naturally, it will be powered by AWS, Amazon's ubiquitous web platform. Amazon says more than 100 games will be available via the Luna Plus channel, and launch titles include Resident Evil 7, Control, Panzer, Dragoon, A Plague Tale Innocence, Surge 2, Ukulele, Grid, Abzu, and Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Amazon says more titles will be added over time. The company also has partnered with Ubisoft for a specific gaming channel, and this is how they describe it. They say that players who subscribe to this channel will have access to their favorite Ubisoft titles in up to 4K resolution, mobile gameplay, and access to new titles when the channel launches, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Far Cry 6, and Immortals Phoenix Rising the same day they release. This is the first of multiple Luna game channels in development where customers can play games from their favorite publishers and genres. 
Luna will also feature Twitch integration. As Amazon says, inside the Luna experience, players will see Twitch streams for games in the service, and from Twitch, they'll be able to instantly start playing Luna games. Games can be played with either a mouse and keyboard or a Bluetooth controller. And to go along with this, Amazon also announced its own Alexa-enabled Luna controller, which will cost $49.99 during the early access period. And this is how they say it works. Luna controller is Alexa enabled and connects directly to the cloud to effortlessly control your game. Featuring a multiple antenna design that prioritizes uninterrupted Wi-Fi for lower latency gaming. In fact, the testing showed a reduction in round trip latency when playing Luna controller with cloud direct versus Luna controller via Bluetooth. With reductions between 17 to 30 milliseconds among PC, Fire TV, and Mac. Now, because the Luna controller connects directly to cloud servers, players can easily switch between screens, such as Fire TV to mobile phone, without additional pairing or configuration changes. Amazon has had a curious relationship with gaming over the years, dabbling in various different businesses. In addition to owning Twitch, you know, the platform we're on, Amazon also has developed its own games, including the online shooter Crucible, which we reported went back into beta after having such a terrible launch. The company is also working on an MMO called New World, which was originally slated to debut this summer before being delayed to next year. And I think it's not surprising with those delays and talking about those games specifically, they have this cloud platforming service that's coming out and it looks like they're probably going to really start to hone in on being a competitor to the X cloud, you know, a competitor mm -hmm. to, uh, 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 to Stadia. And, and really going at this Amazon Game Studios with full force of becoming a more widely accepted uh, uh, distributor and publisher within gaming. At first, I was very skeptical, you know, thinking, why would I buy, you know, Amazon Luna when I could just buy xCloud, which has a ton of great games, which isn't, you know, that expensive. But upon hearing some of these titles like Assassin's Creed, you know, Resident Evil, um, there were some good ones in there, Far Cry 6. Um, and also seeing the Twitch integration, I could see how this has the potential to be successful. I've been kind of curious as to why Amazon hasn't really made any connection to use Twitch to promote its own games, or at least it hasn't, you know, seemed very obvious. Twitch is the, you know, the dominant streaming platform right now, especially for games. Why hasn't Amazon used that more? I think if they do integrate Luna, you know, really easily um, with Twitch, it's easy to use. People understand what it's about. Um, I could see it being successful. That's actually a really uh, good point in terms of bolstering um, their their path to success. Because if they, like you said, if they did find that way to integrate uh, mm -hmm. a cloud gaming service, integrating with a streaming service, and being able to make it still feel streamlined and still yes. feel like it is here at, at, at you know at home, that mm -hmm. opens up just a ton of new possibilities and opportunities for game developers as well as for content creators uh, in that you know specific technology of cloud gaming where you could start to see you know more of these like live events happening when we're getting back into that realm uh, um, you know safely and then mm -hmm. also you know what does that mean for for you know the internet infrastructure trying to handle that and handle that well, as we know that that's something we've been really talking about when it comes to cloud gaming that needs its upgrade and it needs it pretty quick. Right, they, they kind of mentioned their cloud direct versus you know the Bluetooth and how the controller connects directly to the cloud versus the Wi-Fi and then to the cloud and how that might help. But in the past, you know, cloud gaming has been seen as not that premier because of the latency, because of the lag, you know, because it's not as good as just playing a game locally on your computer. Um, and I wonder how, you know, it, or if they're really going to be able to, you know, do a good enough job that you can play these games, because I think it's a big, um, you know, it's a big plus that if you are, you're watching a streamer play a game, you can instantly play that game without downloading anything. Yes. Um, I could see that being, you know, a big potential for like sponsorships or, or you know, click throughs or, or partnerships with that. But if the software doesn't work and the game is too laggy that you can't actually, you know, enjoy the game, then, you know, what's the point there? Yeah, 100% too. And and when we looked at that, something I noticed, like when I looked at the controller and, and it's like, it's a, it looks like an Xbox controller. I'm not, you know, it's familiar. Uh, it, it's it's great that it doesn't have this kind of like GameCube controller feel or like a Nintendo sixty four controller feel, where like it comes out and you're just like, oh, this this just doesn't seem you know like it fits. But it it, it does. You know, it's like a it's a co copy my homework, but you know, make it your own kind of thing. 
Yeah, um, it kind of reminds me of this the Stadia controller too. Like it's it's just a controller. It kind of looks like it's a knockoff, but like it does off brands that you yeah. might buy. Yeah, it does. And and I just keep I'm I'm looking at it here on the on the screen and I'm just like, you know, it it I can here I can actually show this just so we all kind of are getting an understanding. Like when you look at it, you're like, okay, yeah, it's 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 there. It's it's uh it serves its purpose. It's there. I feel like what's most striking to me is the A B X Y configuration because on every controller, oh, yeah. I feel like it's different, you know, especially between like the Switch and the Xbox and PlayStation, they just use shapes instead. Um, I, I I wonder, you know, how gamers are going to like this. I feel like people are pretty picky when it comes to controllers. Yes. Even talking about how like, oh, I can't play on, you know, the Xbox because I hate how the controllers fit in my hands. Like it's yep. really a big factor. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point there. And it is a it is a factor for a lot of gamers. I do like what Guff's comment there too is and, and yeah, I gotta go ahead and give it out to uh, to Kane Guardian for getting the guess of what's in my mug, not just the basic coffee here i'm trying to change it up and and give it that cream give it that sugar give it that whole latte experience very nice um so i wonder you know when this is actually going to launch i hope that when they do launch they're very prepared because yes. crucible and new worlds didn't work out so well and yeah. amazon you know trying to trying to solidify itself in the gaming space as amazon and not Twitch hasn't been doing so well. And I think if Luna, you know, pulls a stadia, it's going to be quite an embarrassment. Yeah. And, and, you know, Sequazi's point there too is, is the point that we were kind of like getting at is how much do you change the controller to make it feel like it's not, you know, it's not uncomfortable. You want it to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. You want it to be, you know, this, this familiar, but somewhat new type, type of experience. And to your point that you just made is like, we really do just have to let the service speak for itself when it comes out and what do gamers feel? Uh, mm -hmm. How do those who may be using uh, the xCloud service already who have talked wonderfully about it, does Luna deliver when it drops and gives people that same impression like Microsoft did out the gate uh, with their cloud gaming service? I'm a little, I, I don't really understand the name choice for Luna. I don't know how it really ties into anything yeah. Um, when I think of Luna, I don't think of gaming at all. Or it doesn't sound kind of hardcore. Maybe they are trying to be more, you know, more to a wider market. Yeah. For, for some reason, it seems like the name of like a women's startup or something to me. <laughs> I don't know if that was like intentional. Right. Um, and the purple branding on the controller, I'm like, does that have to do with uh, with Prime Gaming at all? Is that right. supposed to be like with Twitch? I yeah. think. You, you, maybe you can, can't really change the shape of the controller too much, but I think you can, you know, have the colors be something cool. Like the dual sense controller looks sick, you know, yeah, and it looks like you know, its own colors, controller, right? It looks like its own thing. And I think they could have been a little more um, liberal with their choices, you know, and having like a really nice branded controller that I, I don't know, it's, it's had some cool features versus just seeming like a generic one. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, who could have been a little bit liberal, with their prices on the cheaper side of things is the Xbox Series X announcing their one terabyte expansion, which is gonna cost $220. And yes, you can pre-order it now. So earlier this week, there were reports on the pricing for the upcoming storage card device for the Xbox Series X, which was reportedly a mistake from Smith's Toys UK and Smith's Toys UK quickly retracted it. The price at the time was listed at £159.99, which converted to 205 USD. There was also a rumor earlier this year that listed the price of the expansion at $220. And it does turn out that, that the pricing of the drive is closer to that rumor, and it is now confirmed, which you can pre-order through Best Buy to be $220. And you can go ahead and pre-order that if you want to, but I am sorry, I am very sorry, there is no way I would feel comfortable spending two hundred and twenty dollars, to almost the no. full price of the 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 Xbox Series S, just for the one terabyte expansion. Literally, just buy a Switch Lite in, instead of buying the one terabyte expansion. I mean, to buy like an HDD drive that's one terabyte is maybe like forty five dollars at this point. Like, it's not that expensive, you know. Chad says like even if it's an SSD, that seems very steep for just a terabyte here. I think that's more expensive than than buying a terabyte SSD. Yeah, and what's interesting is a lot of people have gotten their hands recently, these experts and, and analysts on the Xbox Series X, and they're talking about it. They're like, this thing is great. The quick load times, 
you know, the, 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 the moving in and out of the UI into the game. And like, they're talking it up and they're saying all these amazing things with it, which is mm-hmm. great. That's awesome. That's what you want to hear about your next gen console. If you're making this big investment in it, but you also don't want to be in that situation where you're like, I'm very limited on, on space. I'm going to buy the Xbox series S knowing that it is limited on space because my budget doesn't meet it, but I might as well just go ahead and buy the X because if I'm going to buy the S along with the terabyte, I'm going to be paying the roughly the same cost with the X. It just right. is a, I don't understand. Like even as a solid state, $220. I, I, oh my God. I just did like a very cursory search and you can get, you know, a terabyte for $129.99, you know, just like a Samsung SSD. So yes, this, you know, this 220 is, you know, way too high. For, for what it is, that is a good point. Maybe it's really expensive because they're trying to push you to get the Xbox Series X instead of just going with the S. Um, I think this also, I don't, I don't know if maybe it would make people more interested in learning about SSDs themselves mm. because a lot of, you know, I think why people liked these, you know, Xbox expansion cards is because they don't have to know anything about technology. They can just buy the right. Xbox branded one and plug it in. But for $220, yeah. like maybe you could do a little more research if you buy, you know, the PlayStation 5 to get your own, you know, SSD on there. Yeah, and this is something we talked about when we first heard about the expansion becoming a thing, like that that they would have it. Um, like you would have to get a very an exclusive brand set by Microsoft for, mm-hmm. you know, this expansion uh, of memory. And to have this be the announcement and to be the 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 information that you walk away from like you just dealt with the pre-order debacle you just dealt with you know the the whole situation of trying to get yeah. into next gen gaming and you're recognizing you know oh wow you're coming at me with a with a price point for the Xbox Series S where I can get into next gen gaming and it's not breaking the bank and then something I mean you're not even we haven't even addressed like extra controllers and a headset and all right. the stuff that you games. probably want to get so that in games now it's like well, if you want more of those games, you're going to have to shell out, you know, almost the full price after taxes of what you spent on the S in order to, you know, handle all these other games that you want. And I just think it's a bummer. It's Honestly, it's a price point that's a, that's a real bummer for, like, do I want to go down this route? It is. Like, at first glance, I'm like, okay, like, you know, um, $3.99 for console or, you know, $4.99 for console. Like, sh- like, sure. But right when games are now $70 each, when controllers are, I mean, they've been $60 a piece for a while, but also to get like the charging docks or to get, I don't know, maybe you need a separate headset for, for when you play on there. Um, it, it does add up. I, I think it does push, you know, more people to go for the subscription model because it's, you know, maybe cheaper overall for them to play a certain amount of money per month instead of buying all these games. But I like buying games. I yep. personally, you know, stay away from as many subscriptions as I really can. Um, and I don't really like getting subscriptions. I'd rather own a game. I, I think I like the idea of replaying them, even though I never really do. Um, <laughs> I, I just like, you know, the, comforted the option. by the thought. Yes. Comforted by, by the, the thought. By the thought of it. I think that's why a lot of people want backwards compatibility, even yeah. though they don't use it. They just like the thought of it there. Um, and, uh, it really adds up. Um, I hope that this isn't a trend where they're just going to have, you know, a lot of their accessories and accessory, you know, devices and stuff to be yeah. this expensive, especially when they don't need to be. Yeah, one hundred percent. What's up, Philip? I I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And 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 that is part of where I'm like, maybe they'll do what they did when they announced the one. When the one came out, they had that initial price point, and everybody was like, what? And then they came down in price eventually, mm-hmm. pretty actually pretty quickly. So maybe that'll be the same case. Hey, two twenty for this one terabyte, and everybody is like, nah. And they're like, okay, yeah, we're sorry. We should have probably brought that down to like 150. I think 150 is fair for it being a solid I, state. I if you said, fair. you know, 120 is a, a going price for like what you can find online. If you make it 150, it, it just, at that point, it just seems like you guys are really trying to to make me pay a premium just to yes. get something that you say, uh, you know, you're locking it to this specific one in order for me to have the, the expanded memory. It makes me think that like there's a, there's like a ploy somewhere of like, oh, if you have the game pass, it actually, you get a big discount on it. And like, this isn't like the real price. This is just the the high price to make you buy into some other, you know, discount scheme. I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't seem like it, but I feel like I would expect that to happen. Um, This kind of reminds me of, I think Best Buy had its own like gaming subscription thing, or maybe it was just GameStop um, where you can like buy, or you can have certain titles, you're like, 
10 titles a year or something like that. I could see, you know, that coming into play. Like maybe if you have that, then you get a discount, you know, on one of these expansion cards. Yeah, that that would be good for those, uh, you know, brick and mortar places or even online retailers to do something like that. But you were mentioning, you know, kind of felt like a, like a, like a maybe like a scheme or scam or yeah. whatever. Well, to our next story, what kind of feels like some people have been schemed is not actually getting con- confirmation on a question, but finally getting confirmation on a question that felt like Sony was going one way. And then when they were like, but by the way, it's this, we went in the complete other because if you have Spider-Man on your PlayStation 4, you're not going to be t- able to upgrade to the PlayStation 5 version for free. And Sony finally confirmed this. Last week, Sony announced that Spider-Man Miles Morales Ultimate Edition will come with a full remaster of the original Marvel Spider-Man, but neglected to mention whether they'd offer any sort of smart delivery option that would let PS4 owners of the game upgrade to the PS5 version for free. Developer Insomniac Games has already admitted cross-gen saves won't be possible, but some players were still holding out hope that they wouldn't have to double dip to get access to next-gen Peter Parker. Well, the folks at Kotaku finally pried a statement out of Sony, and it isn't good news. As many feared, the only way to get your hands on Marvel Spider-Man's remastered is to purchase Miles Morales Ultimate Edition on PlayStation 5. Now, those who buy it on the PlayStation 4 can upgrade to the PlayStation 5 version of that game for free, but you'll need to pay an extra fee to get the remastered one. And this is Sony's official statement on the matter. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered is an enhanced version of Marvel Spider-Man and is included as part of Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales Ultimate Edition for the PlayStation 5. In addition, players who purchase Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales on PlayStation 4 can upgrade at no additional cost to the PS5 version of Miles Morales and can take advantage of a paid upgrade to download Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered. I think I recall this specific paragraph being tweeted out as being kind of nonsense, like Xbox Series X, Xbox Series S, Xbox One X kind of thing, because it's so hard to follow. Um, But basically, you um you can't get that free remaster you can if you have the ps4 version you can get the ps5 version but if you have the ps4 version you cannot get the ps5 remastered version for free so they also went on to say that there are no plans currently to offer the remastered as a standalone so players with a copy of marvel spider-man for playstation 4 can purchase marvel spider-man miles morales ultimate edition to experience my marvel spider-man remastered on playstation 5. Now, the Marvel Spider-Man for PS4 will also be backwards compatible on the PlayStation 5. And make sure that you're cautious because Sony has confirmed that those who buy a physical copy of Miles Morales for PS4 won't be able to get their free PS5 upgrade if they have the all-digital version of the console. This is what they said on their website. It says that owners of Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales PS4's game disc can access the free upgrade offer by inserting the disc into their PlayStation 5 console. PlayStation 4 game disc owners who buy the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition disc-free console will not be able to access this offer. Which, you know, is confusing to me. It seems like people have a lot of questions about having to pay for next-gen remasters, you know, provided the improvements are significant enough. Um, Sony hasn't really been very clear on what they're doing about this. If they don't want to give away any remasters for free, they can just say so because it's led to a lot of confusion because it seems like they've been teasing that you can get remasters for free. Yeah, that's it. it is, is, is honestly, you've said this one thing, you've presented as this one thing, and now mm-hmm. we're short of, you know, a month or two away from the, the release, and we're now being told this other thing that had you just told us in the beginning, We'd have been more mentally prepared of, okay, which game am I going to buy? How am I going to go about that? Because it's ridiculous to me to be told and remember hearing, oh, yeah, I've got the 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 PlayStation 4, you know, version. The only thing that I would need to buy is the Miles Morales uh, uh, standalone that they, they give, and then I would be able to upgrade. But then it's like, no, that's not the case that you thought it was. You're now needing to get the whole, you know, kit and caboodle for the, for the PlayStation 5. And this whole time, we've all just been sitting here thinking, wait, I thought you were talking about upgrades if I had already bought the game. And I have the digital console reserved, so I'm SOL? Wow, okay. Right, and uh, part of it, I'm like, how much have I kind of confused myself here, maybe? Because the PS5 version of the PS4 game is different than the PS5 remastered version 
but the names are just so close that I'm like, oh, I, I assumed, or maybe in my head, I remembered they were the same thing, but they're not. I think it's kind of shady that there's this difference if you have the physical edition, right? As you already pre-ordered the digital one, now you find out that you can't, you know, have that game over there. I would think that it would be easy enough if you like register your game in your console, you'd be able to download it. You have a UPC score. code, yeah. yeah. I don't understand. You have your own code for the game. Why can't they just implement that? That seems like something that should be, you know, not too hard to do. I couldn't agree more and i echo that just as loudly because it's it's it, i if as a person who's gonna hey what's up artistic charmer welcome welcome um if i uh, you know as a person who has this situation in front of me mm-hmm. like i feel like there is a strong case to be made for myself as well as anyone else that they were under this one understanding based on months of what they have been saying about this game in general and the upgrade. You, if you've got it on the PlayStation 4, it's a free upgrade to the PlayStation 5. We're going to make that transition quick and, and easy. Oh, by the way, no, that's not true. It, it feels like if you're going to buy a physical version or digital commercial, digital version, you're kind of committing to the long run here because I could see in the future, maybe they're like, well, if you have it on digital, you're going to have to get it on disc for whatever reason for the physical version, which I don't know if that's going to happen, but I wouldn't be surprised at this point, you know, if that were to happen in the future, which I think is just, you know, a really unnecessary um, difference between the two consoles. I assume they both have, you know, on online capability. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to kind of like gate keep between the two if you happen to get, you know, the other version. Yeah, hopefully they'll respond to this. Hopefully there's enough, you know, backlash to this story. I think there should be. They have been saying one thing for a long time, have made it feel as if we fully understood what that one thing was. And then just that Kotaku article kind of having to get them to, you know, actually address the the elephant in the room. Can you say this officially? Right. And then they were like, no, we can't. And here's what it actually is. And like you were saying, that confusion feels like Xbox Series S, Xbox Series X. It just mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't help at all. No. Uh, especially, especially just with the costs of these things, recognizing that games are going to get start to get more expensive, the cost of the technology in and of itself. There's a lot of disregard for the burden financially on these choices. Yes. When you have so many of these players and users wanting to get more involved in the next gen uh, uh, systems, and they might just not be able to because of of that financial uh, burden. That's true. You know, it's not just a question of clarity and, you know, the messaging from these companies, you know, these do come down to financial conditions or financial restrictions on the consumer. Um, And they do have to take that into account when they purchase these consoles. I hope that anything else that might seem kind of shady gets sorted out or, you know, gets cleared up before, you know, before launch date, because there are no more pre-orders. You're going to have to wait until when these consoles launch to be able to, you know, get your hands on one if you haven't already. Um, I hope it's all sorted out before then. I agree, but what you don't have to wait for is for those of Call of Duty Warzone players out there like myself, Season 6 is dropping, and it drops very soon. In the next 24 hours, we will all get a chance to get our hands on this new season that has implemented uh, a new feature that I'm actually pretty excited about. So Call of Duty Warzone and Modern Warfare Season 6 is right around the corner, and for the new season, Activision and Infinity Ward are adding an unexpected new feature to the former. By expanding into Battle Royale, the Call of Duty series is experimenting with features it's never dabbled with in the past. Battle Royale is a whole different beast than traditional multiplayer, and there's nothing more emblematic than this newest feature coming to Warzone, which is fast travel. Fast travel? Wait, so how is fast travel being added to the game? Well, it is being added via the Verdansk subway system, which was announced recently after leaking months ago. In the Battle Royale's mode's ongoing narrative, the reason behind the subway system is to find this Al Katala member hiding underground. And with the subway system, not only is there now fast travel, but there's going to be new areas to explore. An official blurb about the feature reads, with this transportation system fully operational at the start of season six, all operators in Verdansk can now move it to get around the war zone faster than ever before between numerous points of interest. And of course, there are now a few new areas to explore, complete with supply boxes and loose loadout items, which can get your whole squad on the right track towards victory. So according to Infinity and Activision, At the start of every round, the subway systems will have numerous open stations to explore, all of which have the exact same layout. And of course, the actual train will never lead you to a station swallowed up by the circle. 
So they promise. Further, the train won't move if there's a conflict on board between the train and the platform, which means fighting will need to be maintained to the platform, stairwells, and outside the station. For now, it remains to be seen what type of impact this is going to have on the meta and how drastically it impacts map navigation. But at the moment, it sounds like it's going to, at the very least, completely change up the map navigation here in this game. What do you think? What was your initial response to this? I'm excited to see what that's like. If you, I, I just want to know if there's going to be this moment where you get on a subway and you want to go to your destination, but you don't want to fight, that you and the team are right. waiting. Like you're waiting so you get to the destination and then the fight breaks out. Um, I'm also curious of what those fights are going to be like on the subway systems themselves. I am curious if they're going to be able to avoid what they say, you know, is sounds like a potential bug where you get on the subway and it takes you into a region where there's gas and you die, you know, and there's just nothing you could do about it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm excited to, to witness that if it does occur. I think this is for me, the more I, I realize what they're doing with Warzone. Mm-hmm. the bigger this battle royale becomes and they're maintaining it. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're right. maintaining the amount of players and they're maintaining it server wise because I've noticed I've, I've seen less in terms of uh, server latency and, and issues. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I've had less of the disconnect thing that I used to be going on uh, uh, a couple that started back on season four. So it looks like they're trying to really create this unique battle royale experience that you can only get here in Warzone. What about you? Yeah, it just sounds really fun to be able to fast travel around the map. I feel like it's going to, you know, change up the game and and make and keep that, you know, arcade feeling that a lot of people like from Warzone that, you know, anything can happen. It's always really fun. It's always really chaotic. Um, I think it sounds really cool. I also hope that it executes well or yeah. that it's not too often that there are so many fights that you can't actually use the train. Um, sure. I, I assume <laughs> yes. that, that most people will like... I, I could see some people like camping, you know, in these subway oh stations All the for time. people to yeah. come down. Right. I, I wonder how it's really going to change the strat. Um, and if people are going to be, you know, zipping around the map a, a lot faster than before, which, you know, which is always fun in any battle royale. Yeah. I mean, now we can have legit subway rats because you do have a lot of those yeah. players who play in that manner. They hide, they wait and they come out and they do their, you know, their attack. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to be really interesting. I'm, I am, I am excited for it. Um, and, and I want to see, you know, to what level that goes, because a lot of what has been swirling around Warzone is that we're going to get a full map change of the battle Royale experience when, uh, cold war drops. And so Mm -hmm. I wonder if something will be come into play with the subway and the nuke and all these rumors and stuff that have swirled around, you know, Warzone and how it's going to alter and change, uh, uh, specifically with the new game. I'm, 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 I'm low key hyped. You know, I, I really am. I have to admit it. I'm impressed that they've been able to, you know, keep up the excitement with all these updates. I was very skeptical at the outset, you know, thinking it's just another battle royale. What are they going to do that's different? But it seems like they've really, you know, kept some of that magic there to keep players coming back. Um, and I think it's, it's really cool that they've, you know, added on to the world so much and added this new element here. It does seem like the more seasons that go on, the game isn't getting stale. It's just getting better. It's just getting more different. It's getting more complex. Um, and I'm kind of surprised that none of the rumors, you know, with the nuke um, or, or the map change have really, you know, escalated at all yes. yet. It seems like they're still just like kind of in the background still, you know, could always happen. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's a good way, you know, to keep people really invested in what's going on. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that I remember uh, reading about was if we look at the time period of when their seasons go on, we are right in the time period of this next season will end right around Cold War's release. And usually that's when something big happens, right. like implementing a, a, a subway system. Is there a fast travel system in uh, um, other battle royales like a, like like this that you can think of? Because I don't Not I personally I haven't heard of. of something like this. I don't think so. Not in Fortnite. You know, there's helicopters, but there's no fast travel. I don't think even in Spellbreak, you know, you can have a lot of mobility, but not, you know, n- not fast travel like that. Thank you so much, Kai, by Hi, the way, for, so the for the dono. Thank you thank so, you. so much. You, we really you. appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think there has been fast travel in Battle Royale. I think a lot of people would, you know, be kind of mad that it would be like game breaking or something. Yeah. But I think the way that they've kind of gone about it by, you know, you can't you can't travel when there are enemies nearby, really. Uh, yeah. um, I think it's a nice way to kind of balance it out a bit more. 
I, I do too. And and that's why the whole, like, if it is, if there is a fight, it doesn't move. It's not like there's no, mm-hmm. there's no possibility. So if you, I guess if you are on your way to this location and you decide to fight, it's just going to stop until the fight is over and then get you over there to your destination. I think for all Warzone players, you got to be mentally prepared for bugs, for glitches, for crashes, for issues, because I think every season where they've implemented something new and big, some type of game breaking element comes with it or somebody figures out how to get out of the map or, or whatever's going to happen. Just be mentally prepared for that because it is an awesome feature, but it just feels like one that I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen after we've got this subway system. You've got people under the map, got people above the map where, yeah. you know, where are the errors within that? That's not true. Kane also brings up cheaters. Maybe there is some, you know, cheating thing that can be implemented that you can always use a subway or, you know, yeah. something like that. Um, you, you can be excited for this. I, I think it's warranted to be excited, but I guess you've got to be a little forgiving or don't have your expectations too high because for this sure. is war zone. That, that's a great point. Uh, and that needs to be the tagline. <laughs> Manage those expectations. This is war zone. But a game where hopefully you don't have to manage your expectations for is Star Wars Squadrons. As the progression rewards and more details about the game have been, you know, explained recently. So I got to be honest, I am really excited about this game. The variety that's coming within the gameplay and, and, and handling your 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 ship. So Squadrons releases uh, on October 2nd. And EA has released details regarding the progression rewards rank and more. And it is important to remember that Squadrons is a self-contained game where all unlocks and rewards are earned by playing and they can't be bought with real world money. And as a side note, Kai did guess what's in the mug. I have mango tea today. Hey. Great guess. So Moda Studios goes in depth into Squadron's online experience when it comes to progression with what the studio calls the challenges, operations, and level. Each of these will reward the player with glory, which is a currency that can only be earned by playing and is used to unlock cosmetics. So challenges, your main forms of reward beyond post-match earnings will be through challenges, daily and operation challenges. They're timed, rotating objectives that you can complete to get rewards while playing. You'll want to regularly complete your daily challenges to keep getting rewarded while playing squadrons. They're often simple objectives that provide you with glory to unlock cosmetics for your starfighters and pilots and encourage you to try different ships and components to achieve completion. Glory is also earned based on how you perform in a match. Operation challenges, however, are different. They can reward you with unique cosmetics and are tied to the game's ongoing operations. And operations are eight-week cycles that happen in squadrons. And each operation brings with it a set of unique cosmetic rewards that can only be earned by completing this challenge. Now, certain challenges also offer unique rewards too. So once they're gone, you won't be able to get the cosmetic unless the operation challenge returns one day. And seeing which pilots are showing off their unique flair will be a good way to tell if you're up against a dedicated ace. Also tied to these eight-week resets is your fleet battles rank. With every operation's conclusion and the start of a new one, your competitive rank tied to fleet battles will reset, allowing for a regular reassessment of your skills. To get your first rank, you'll need to play in 10 placement matches. And this is how they have uh, um, put aside the ranks from lowest to highest. You have Maverick, you have Hotshot, you have Hero, Hero, you have Valiant, you have Legend, and then Galactic Ace. So Thomas Muir, um, operations said, he says that operations are our take on competitive play through a ranked ladder system that resets every eight weeks, a way for our players to test their skills and teamwork capabilities in our more strategic mode, fleet battles. Which they believe is the bread and butter of their multiplayer game because this system is built to encourage players to improve their skills without being overly punishing if you run into some bad luck. Players are protected from demotion into lower divisions for the length of an active operation, which means you can't drop from Legend to Valiant, but you can drop from Legend 3 to Legend 2. And at the end of the operation, players receive glory based on the maximum rank achieved rather than their current rank. This is to push pilots to go as far as they can. 
Players also get exclusive helmets upon reaching the Valiant Legend and Galactic Ace ranks for the first time. These are the same across all operations, so if you didn't manage to get the ones you wanted during your first operation, you can still get them in upcoming ones. I also noticed that the way the ranks work, it seems that like Legend 3 is higher than Legend 2, which is the opposite from League of Legends, where Legend 2 would be higher than Legend 3, for example. So I guess it's, 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 a, little, it's a little bit different here. Yeah, it is. And they go on to talk more about like the levels because players will have their own personal level. Your level is a linear progression path that does not reset, unlike your competitive rank. For the first 40 levels, you'll unlock requisition points that can be used to unlock ship components. If you're one of our more dedicated pilots, they say, and you hit level 40, you'll have enough points to unlock all components allowing you to try out every potential star fighter build. And their goal with leveling isn't that you'll get more powerful as you level up, but rather you'll have more options available to you to play via these components. So there will also be occasional bonus events that play out over time, including ones that provide additional glory. Beyond that, completing parts of the game will also provide you with cosmetic bundles. Players will get a bundle of cosmetics for completing the single player story mode and another for completing the fleet battles tutorial. And lastly, the studio announced that Star Wars Squadrons has gone gold, which means the game is done with testing and ready to be sent to manufacturers to be pressed and sent to various retailers. It sounds like they're really gunning for a lot of hardcore players. When I hear that operations, you know, and, and your fleet battles rank, I think resets every eight weeks. I'm like, eight weeks? Like League of Legends seasons are pretty much a full year and I have not played, you know, remotely as many games as I'd like to. Yeah, and one of the things that they've talked about is like, the way your cosmetics are of your ship, as you can see over to the left, this little bobblehead um, uh, of, right. this, of mm -hmm. this Ewok, you're 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 grabbed as a Star Wars fan by like, well, how do I get to make my cockpit feel like it fits me and my personality? And that's the thing too is this is the way you always play the game. There's no third person mm -hmm. perspective to the game. You're always in the cockpit and you're playing, and virtual reality is possible on both PC VR as well as PS VR. So all of these elements that would keep you like I'm showing up, I'm playing, I'm getting better. We haven't even talked about like the gameplay itself, what right. it requires. Um, there is so much to the game that it isn't just oh I jump in and fly around and shoot. You can divide your, you can uh, uh, divert your energy of your ship into different areas of your ship based on where mm -hmm. you are in battle. So if you're being overloaded by enemies and you need to protect yourself, you can divert all your energy to your shields. Do you want to put it on the front of your ship? Do you want to put it on the back of your ship? Those are all options and choices you have to make while in combat and dealing with this issue. And I find that added layer of, of complex approach to, to gameplay to be one that is seems very rewarding for those who commit to being a really top player with squadrons. I really hope this is fun because I think my one reservation is I could see this getting a little bit repetitive if you're kind of mm. doing, you know, the same fleet battles over and over. Um, I also wonder, you know, how robust the cosmetics are going to be. It seems like they're going to be a big part of, you know, leveling up or, or doing these operations or doing these challenges. It's it's a lot about cosmetics. So I hope that there's a lot of, you know, variety in that. And it's not just like different shades of blue or, or yes. whatever, you know, for some of their options. It does seem, you know, very complex. I wonder, you know, what the learning curve with this is as well, you know, how often people are going to be playing this game and, you know, how, how long each session is going to be. Because at a glance, it seems doable, but also kind of tricky with all the different things going on and all the different options, you know, with how you can customize your ship or as he said, you know, how you have to, you know, make decisions in the moment. That's the part that I am most excited about as a competitive player and one who is drawn to uh, learning a system and growing uh, to be, to have that competitive advantage. Like I know how to handle this situation when I'm, you know, I've got too many, you know, enemies attacking me at once, or I need to wipe out these, you know, these targets. So I divert all my energy into my, into my blasters. Like there's so much here for, that I think what you just said too is they're really trying to pull in those hardcore players. They're really trying to draw over those people that would naturally be committed to a first person experience on a on a shooter level. But in this mm -hmm. now this you know zero grab flying experience and rooted in an intellectual property like Star Wars, it, it just seems more of a draw. You know what I mean? It just it seems to have more of this bigger net to bring in players that you might not expect that would come over and play a, a, a flying game like this. 
I think that this game is also probably going to be what I wanted from the Disney Star Wars ride experience. I don't know if anyone <laughs> in the chat has been on that, but like the two people in the front are, are the pilots and then two others are gunners. And then I was an engineer, which you just press light up. Just press, you just press button. buttons as they light up. And I was like convinced it's like for parents that don't really want to like do something interactive. So much like, fun, dear. Yes. Okay. I pushed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and there are only you know two people that could actually pilot the machine so i hope that this is my way to actually experience the ride as i wish i did in the first place yeah i'm i'm j j like for me this is one of those games where i hope it, it it executes uh because i would be very excited to it's just a nice break from your typical first person shooter online competitive experience and it's star wars yeah. you know what i mean like it's star wars. there's no denying that it's gonna be pretty awesome to have your own cockpit and what bobblehead doll you can have in your cockpit and how you know your pilot will look and how your ship will look knowing that you might not be the one seeing it on the outside but knowing mm. other players are seeing you know how your ship is is designed uh in battle i think there's 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 a strong potential here that like you were saying uh before if the foundation is good Mm -hmm. They have a lot to build off here. They do. And I think this game is appealing to anyone in the chat who's not a diehard Star Wars fan. I can only name like five characters, but like this game just looks like fun. It looks like you don't, you know, you don't really need to be well versed in the Star Wars universe. I know personally with some fandoms, I'm like, I don't want to say I like this because I don't, I'm not as hardcore as all these other people, you know, kind of thing where it's like, I, I like Star Wars, but I don't really know much about it, which is fine. Yeah. And I, I think for, for squadrons, you know, you don't need to know so much about the lore. You can just jump in and play the game. I, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's also just like a really fun, you know, yeah. game where you can, you know, fly your spaceship around in space and do battles in space. And, yep. and, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a great way to bring in, you know, more people to the Star Wars fandom. Yeah. And to, uh, to Kai's point, the, the question there, how much will it cost? Obviously, we're talking about electronic arts here. You're going to be spending money, right? You're going to be having these microtransactions. They just want your wallet. All of what we've talked about on this uh, uh, information regarding squadrons, you have to play the game to get. They're not talking about using real world money to get it. And I find that to be the most surprising thing that I'm like, I might play your game a little bit more because I don't feel like you're just trying to nickel and dime me for everything that I want in your game. I just have to play your game more. So that is something that I think to to Kai's question where I get where it's coming from. This is EA and, you know, you know, obviously with Disney behind it, trying to rework that image of like, what content are we creating? Why are we creating it? And for what consumer are we creating it for? That's a great point. This is, I think, an opportunity for them to really, you know, turn the tides on on the perception of them, you know, to have this be, you know, Star Wars, you know, Disney backed game and there aren't microtransactions. You do just have to play the game. I hope the quality is still going to be there because there is not going to be, you know, monetary incentive, you know, besides more people playing um, more stream time, you know, bigger user base. Um, we haven't heard about a battle pass or, or a paid battle pass or anything. I kind of hope we don't. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a year Year yes. from yet now we we saw that coming out um but for now um you don't have to pay for anything in the game you just have to play to get these rewards yeah that's that is very very exciting and 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 moving into our next story is one that i think a lot of people were excited about we're going to get a sequel to among us but then actually it looks like among us 2 is canceled however there seems to be a very good reason why among us 2 has been canceled it's not so sus <laughs> In response to Among Us's rising popularity, the developer Inner Sloth has decided to focus on expanding the game's features and content instead of working on a new sequel. So they decided to cancel Among Us 2 and instead focus on expanding the content offered in the first Among Us. In a blog post, the developer wrote that the decision was made in response to the recent spike in popularity for the party survival game, which has been downloaded over 41 million times in just September alone. So Inner Sloth wrote this, all of the content that we had planned for Among Us 2 will instead go into Among Us 1. And this is probably the more difficult choice because it means going deep into the core of the code of the game and reworking several parts of it. We have lots of things planned and we're excited to bring new content to everyone as you continue to enjoy playing. These content expansions include new servers, colorblind support, a friends and account system, and a new stage. Though Inner Sloth added that there are lots of other things planned too, we just need to prioritize and organize. Now, Inner Sloth didn't provide an exact ETA on when players can expect this new content to arrive. 
Though the developer did write that working on the servers is currently taking all the development time. The, friend, the new friends and account systems is also definitely taking some time, they say. Although it was first released in 2018, Among Us, as many of you know, has seen a tremendous rise in players in 2020, likely due to, you know, a lot of streamers playing it on Twitch, a lot of streams popping off with that. According to Sensor Tower, Among Us earned 18.4 million mobile downloads in August, only to be followed by another 41.9 million mobile downloads in September. It shot up the Steam charts as well, alongside larger AAA title games that were released more recently. And like with Fall Guys, certain platforms have been able to play Among Us for free. I mean, it's $5 on Steam and mobile devices support a free version. The lower barrier to entry certainly helped it get to such a large audience, though its only recent rise in popularity is peculiar. The game's simple graphics scale well to a variety of platforms, and technically speaking, it should have no issue running on a Switch instead. There are particular challenges in communicating with players on that platform. However, not only does the Switch only have a text communication system, um, but it doesn't allow voice chat unless you have a separate app on your mobile device, which means that no one would use voice chat. And Among Us is available for PC and mobile devices. Its simple interface only uses a few on-screen buttons and prompts, which makes it extremely simple to control even on smaller screens. When asked if Xbox One, PS4, and Nintendo Switch versions would be possible, Interslot Studio programmer Forrest Willard explained that making console ports of Among Us would be complicated. The communication systems necessary for this are a large reason. It differs from certain similar games such as Gary's Mod, such as the Gary's Mod mode Trouble in Terrorist Town, which supports voice chat by default. I also saw, you know, a similar article that relates to this that a lot of Discord mobile downloads have shot up because of people playing Among Us. Yeah. They've also been downloading discord as well so you know uh, um the popularity of among us has you know translated to other successes you know in the gaming space it, it has and and yeah it, there's a lot of people playing this game and i think that's probably where the drive is in in this decision to forego an among us two we've already got mm -hmm. all these people who have downloaded our game we need to figure out how to rework the code i commend them for taking this approach because a lot of developers would just be like no we're going to create a second one you're gonna have to buy that one. That's what we have to do as developers in order to, to make it easier on us because Intersloth did acknowledge this is the harder route to go, which is like, I wanna see them continue to be successful. Um, not just because it's it's humorous to watch these game this game get played and to see all the different memes and stuff like that come out, but it's also uh, commendable for a smaller development company to mm -hmm. be doing something quite groundbreaking you know, for, right. for a party game like this. I see a lot of similarities between Inner Sloth and Media Tonic, you know, of Fall Guys, where they're both like being people. They're both, you know, not crazy revolutionary games, but yeah. they, they did one thing and they did that thing really well. Yeah. And it seems like they do really care about, you know, their their base of players. This isn't like a money grab. They're just trying to do, you know, what, what they think is is the right thing, which is also, you know, what feels like the best thing, you know, as a consumer, as a community member, it doesn't feel like a money grab. Um, it seems like they're happy to have people play their game and they want to support that. And they want, you know, people to continue playing, um, playing. Um, I know Fall Guys has seemingly kind of had a little bit of a drop in popularity. A lot of people are kind of going over to Among Us. I wonder how long this game is going to stay popular, you know, especially as more people are, you know, newly getting into it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I will say that with Fall Guys' next season coming up, there might be that mm -hmm. rise in that again. And who knows, as long as we have these very socially inclusive type games that just continue to add, which I still get the feel, no matter, sometimes the subject matter with, with Fall Guys can be sus. There's a wholesome aspect to these titles that I think mm -hmm. resonates with most gamers. And that mm -hmm. is largely the appeal of these experiences versus something like Warzone where it's shoot and kill and blow up and it's constantly intense and somebody's going right. to say something racist when you kill them. You know what I mean? Like that's mm -hmm. like that's a thing that just comes with that 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 game when you play it mm -hmm. whereas these don't seem to make you feel that way whatsoever. 
Right, and, and to anyone worried about streaming Among Us, some people were like, Kaisa, don't stream it because there's a general chat. There's a general chat for a, a lot of games. Generally, if you just try your best on Twitch, they won't take you know any action against you. Um, it, it does seem like Among Us, most people are there to have fun, um, not really troll around. I, I think it's you know really cool to see that these these games are a way for people to come together and to you know speak to that social aspect. You know, especially now since you know a lot of gamers are using games you know as their new way to socialize, as a new way to you know party up with their friends because we can't do it IRL right now. Right, and something not a lot of us want to do IRL right now is fly in a plane or travel because you want to be safe. But this game we didn't get to talk, to, talk about last week, definitely want to talk about today. It's hilarious, honestly, the footage when I was watching it, Kaiser, you were like, this is what it is. And it is legit that as there is an AMC games called Airplane Mode, and this is our silly game of the week. So the Silly Game of the Week segment was requested by the chat, you know, through our mailbag submissions. So AMC Games Airplane Mode, the Microsoft Flight Simulator for the rest of us, is coming to Mac and Windows PC on October 15th. When AMC Games says this is, quote, the most realistic flight simulator ever created, the company means it. You know, we're not skilled airplane pilots. I don't know how to fly a plane. So Airplane Mode understands that we are just all people who have been on a plane before and, you know, I guess some of us might want to be told where to sit and have a flight attendant cater to you. So from the developers, Backronym Games, Airplane Mode lets the player delight in a two or six hour flight from New York's JFK airport to either Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada or Reykjavik, Iceland. AMC Games released a live action trailer on Thursday that we're about to put up here and the developer thought of everything. Crying baby, you got it. Meal service, of course. In-flight safety video produced by IFC? Yep, that too. And think you're risk-free from delays? Not a chance. So in last Thursday's news release, AMC Games said airplane mode features a host of content for players to enjoy while in their seats. Of course, there's a magazine called Stratospheres where you can read stuff and play Sudoku. Don't forget your cell phone charger because you can also listen to an ambient music podcast from musician and game developer Noah Sasso. There are other exclusive podcasts coming too, but they haven't been announced yet. Good luck listening to them though if you've got bad Wi-Fi on your flight. Experience what might be possible what might be possibly the most challenging video game you've ever played. This is what the developer wrote on the release saying, will you experience the relief of being disconnected from the outside world or will listlessness prove to be your final boss battle? Honestly, it feels like it could go either way. Airplane mode will cost $11.99 when it's released for Mac and Windows PC on Steam. And personally, this game looks horrible. I would only play this if I lost a bet. It just seems like something I would not want to play, but great as a joke gift, maybe. That's See, I find it humorous in that way. I'm also curious if they're going to continue to add things into this, these like surrounding environmental features that yes. might be what draws you back in like they update the magazines maybe there's some form of in-flight entertainment you know maybe some things right. begin to happen um that they have like these like expansions that draw you in to play more that would be so funny if it's like, hey, there's a new edition of, you know, Stratospheres, if they introduce like a Sky Mall, you know, type magazine as well. Or like may maybe there's a deal with like movies. You could watch certain movies, you know, on your in-flight thing. So basically flying in a game that's for real, this is a real game. Um, I believe the playtime is the length of those flights, you know, going from um, from from New York to, to Nova Scotia. Um, you're, you're sitting on the plane enjoying your flight. Yeah, I've, I, this is... Uh... This is so funny. I'm sorry. Like I, I give him so like, just the fact that this was developed and you know produced and now it's being sold 11.99. I, oh my god, I can't believe this is a real thing. It's so funny. It's so funny to me. It's a real thing. Um, but that does bring us to near the end of our news. So to tease some topics for tomorrow, we're gonna get into how the Bethesda founder discusses the sale to Microsoft and what that is going to mean for in development games. We're gonna talk about our esports roundup, which we would have talked about today at the top of tomorrow's episode. We're gonna talk about the original farm bill on Facebook it is shutting down at the end of the year, but this wasn't a big surprise since Facebook's not supporting Flash games anymore. And who still plays Farmville? We're also gonna be talking about Amazon is warning Xbox Series X pre-order customers that their consoles might show up late. 
which is a bummer of a news. But if you have any topics you'd like us to cover, you can submit them to our mailbag. Um, we're also looking to interview more game developers. So if there's anyone you know or any any indie games you particularly like, and you're like, hey, maybe you should reach out to you know these developers, we would love to hear it. We would love to hear those suggestions. Absolutely. And thank you for all of you that like follow subscribe to our twitch to our youtube we really appreciate you like kaiza and i always say this is not possible without the amazing human beings that you are and that dgn family that we just love and support and they you know do the same to us so thank you so much for everything that you're doing we'll be running a reruns after this show and also be posting on the youtube if you're watching a rerun or a vod or a clip we are live from 1 to 2 p.m pacific time every weekday but for this September 28th, 2020, Daily Gaming News Hour, I am Rome. I am Kaisa. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch you tomorrow. See you next time, everybody.